Hello everyone, let us continue our discussion on the patterning. So, we looked at lithography process where we transferred our design from the mask onto the photoresist. So, now we have to take the structures from the photoresist and transfer into silicon by using dry edge process. Right? So, we use dry edge process because this is a standard CMOS process we use for patterning which is much much better and controllable than other wet edge processes that we have. So, let us look at the dry edge process now. So, the dry edge process offers you know anisotropic etching. So, we need to look at what is what do we mean by anisotropic etching. So, for that I will use this cartoon where we have the photo mask here this is photo resist and this photo resist is patterned using lithography now. So, when we say isotropic so the etching both in vertical direction and etching in horizontal direction are identical. So, etch rate in vertical and etch rate horizontal this is all equal the removal rate in both the directions are identical. So, that is called isotropic etch. So, we also have something called anisotropy right. So, this is opposite of isotropic anisotropy means there is some directionality right. So, that directionality could be based on the crystal plane. or it could be just vertical right. So, this is physical edge where you know you just transfer the, the structure that we have right. So, you follow through the, the profile and then remove the material underneath, but in this case the direct uh, the edge is directional right. So, there is a difference in the uh, edge rate vertical and horizontal. So, this is also termed as anisotropic edge, but more precisely this is called directional edge right. So, if you want to have your waveguides right, you, you prefer to have it vertical right. So, in order to fabricate this it is better to use a vertical uh, edge process than a directional edge process that will give you sloped side walls all right, which is something that we do not want. So, let us look at uh, the different methods available for us um, to do this dry edge process. So, the dry edge process can be done with two ways one is glow discharge method the other one is iron beam method. So, in glow discharge method we use um, you know plasma etching right we create plasma which is called reactive plasma gas or you could do reactive iron etching which has high energy. So, here L e is low energy and H e is high energy right. So, glow discharge sputtering is again a, a, a dry edge process that we can use that has high energy. The other uh, methods are based on ions. So, in this case this is all you know a reactive gas species is in this case we are going to use ions very heavy ions that can be accelerated and then you can do ion milling of, of, of uh, the material that you have on the surface right. So, this is a, a physical process where you have high energy ions that is kicking out you know uh, the, the material that is on the surface. So, the chemically assist ion beam etching is another type of process that you can use which uses ions, but it is also reactive in nature. So, the reactive ion beam is the, the, the ion beams that are coming in the ions themselves are reactive in nature right. So, in this case there are inert ions in both the cases they are not going to be reacting they are just going to kick out the atoms uh, sitting here based on the momentum that this uh, incoming ion has. But then reactive ion beam um, is, is, is something that where you use uh, reactive ions. So, the ions are reactive in nature. So, when they come they react with the material right and then take the material out. So, these are all the two methods of uh, dry etching available to us. We primarily use the plasma uh, process here which is a which is a standard CMOS process um, and there are a lot of parameters um, to control the plasma. 
So, you have excitation uh, frequency right um, uh, into the, the plasma chamber that you have. So, the plasma chamber let me first explain how this plasma chamber is, is, uh, is, is constructed. So, you have two electrodes right on this uh, positive or negative electrode or you have the, the, uh, the, 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 the live electrode and the ground electrode and then this whole electrode uh, configuration is put inside a vacuum chamber. And then we apply a RF voltage right, so RF power into this uh, uh, top electrode that makes plasma you know between the two plates. So, this is capacitively coupled uh, plasma that is created here right. So, there are various factors that determine the plasma here. So, one is the frequency that we have, the power of the RF, uh, the gas flow because you need to create this plasma right. So, you have to put some glass into this. So, gas flow, um, the nature of the discharge itself um, uh, whether it is electro positive, negative. So, normally it is electro positive in nature um, and what are all the gases that you have there. Uh, the geometrical factor like how big or small uh, the chamber is, the electrode is and also the asymmetry between the electrodes. The electrodes need not be identical in, uh, in size, they could be uh, a difference in size. And then the pumping speed right, so the vacuum pump determines also the flow here right and the pressure associated. So, these are all the factors uh, it is associated with the plasma and now the plasma is created, but we are going to put the wafer here right and expose the, the wafer to the plasma uh, that is that, that, that we created between these two plates. And the plasma to surface uh, uh, parameters are also important because that is what creates the reaction here right. So, the surface geometry is also important here that means, whether it is uh, the wafer is much smaller than the electrode or equal size. Um, the temperature you have on the on the on the surface here because the the plasma species, the reactive species that are going to come onto the surface, uh, based on the surface temperature, uh, the diffusion length of the species are going to change. Okay, so there are um, there are uh, uh, diffusion lengths associated with the edge. So, your surface temperature should also be taken care and finally, the surface potential because your uh, uh, ions are going to be driven right or the electrons in this case and also um, you have charged particles in this plasma that will be uh, affected by the potential that you have on the surface right. So, this plasma will have positive, negative and also neutral species right. So, you want to make sure that we take care of those species right. So, the plasma process is not only used for um, you know uh, uh, etching process, we can also use this plasma for deposition, we will see that deposition little later. So, we can use the same plasma, but using two different gases right. So, for example, if I want to deposit silicon dioxide, so this is a uh, a popular cladding material like there is a glass coating or you know uh, uh, amorphous silicon dioxide is a standard uh, coating material um, uh, that we do um, on top of the waveguides. So, that can be deposited by using a silene gas and NO2 gas. So, the silene gas will be uh, decomposed in the pl plasma to SiH2 um, and 2 H and, and, and a free electron here and then the electron will bombard with um, N, NO, N 2 O in this case right uh, creating N 2 and O. So, in this case this is N 2 O right. So, your nitrogen is available and then the oxygen. So, the nitrogen is a gas here and then the hydrogen is also gas. So, now we are going to make this oxygen react with this SiH 2 radical creating SiO 2 right and then this water vapor which is a gas again. So, the whole idea here is you take two gases right, you take two gases and then make them react with each other and create a non volatile solid product. So, this is what we would like to do right. So, we want to create a solid out of gas right? so that is deposition. So, we use plasma for that. And on the right side we have etching. So, now we want to etch silicon dioxide let us say. 
So, here we can do this by using C F 4 and R gun. Right. You can even leave out R gun, you can just do it with C F 4, but R gun plays an important role here. So, R gun supplies you know lot of electrons. So, it will supply electrons here and by supplying electrons, so that electron bombards with, uh, with C F 4 creating fluorine. Right. So, when you have 4 fluorine react with S i O 2, it creates S i F 4, which is a volatile product. Okay, so, this oxygen is volatile and this is also volatile. So, while your silicon is solid or silicon dioxide here is a solid. So, you create a volatile product from a solid product is called you know plasma etching or dry etching process in this case. So, this is a, a cartoon that explained how this etching process happens. Right? So, you have the plasma. Right? And then from the plasma you, you react with the material of choice. In this case, you have silicon and it reacts with silicon. And when it reacts with silicon, it can create H byproducts. And these byproducts can go into the plasma or these byproducts can go and stick onto the side walls. Right? So, that those two are possibilities. A or, or you can also have um, you know products from plasma deposited on the side walls also, right? But the photoresist that you have, this is photoresist, right? So the plasma will also attack photoresist, and the products will go into the plasma. Okay. So what you see here is a is a silicon edge process. So this is silicon, and what you see is here the boundary. And this is your photoresist. Right? You can see here um, it should have been like this, but after etching uh, silicon, um, we have lost some photoresist because the the plasma also etches photoresist. Right? But then you can see here very vertical side walls. Right? So the vertical side walls are here. But then after removal, right? After PR removal, you see you get the silicon wire, right? So, this is silicon, but now you see a sloped sidewall. We do not have a vertical sidewall like we had here. So, here we had vertical sidewall, but then when you look at this process more carefully, right? This vertical sidewall is just an illusion, right? That illusion is because you have sidewall coating, what we call the passivation coating, and that's why I mentioned the byproducts can also go and fall on the sidewalls. So when these byproducts fall on the sidewalls, they start accumulating because the top region is more exposed, right? So your thickness, you know, thus you have thicker passivation or the protection layer that you have right in order to create vertical hedge so but when you remove this guy right so this is what we saw you know um, here right so when we remove this now the sloped sidewall shows up right so when you are uh, developing a edge process right and if you want to have a vertical sidewall for your waveguides this is something that we should all keep in mind right you have to clean it up and check whether you know you are not uh, seeing some illusion when you are doing process development and the chemistry will also have a, a, a significant effect on the sidewalls right so what what is done here is a it's a two step process right so, I am going to draw a dotted line where there is no change, right? So, this is process A, 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 and A. So, there is no change in that, and that is the reason why you will see the same kind of um, you know slope along this, right? But then there is a change in the second process, right? There is B1, B2, B3, and B4. So, in this process, we, um, the the HBr O2 chemistry is used to remove silicon, right? So the silicon uh, will be removed from this chemistry using SiBr4 plus 2O2, right? So this is what will happen when you expose this 
to uh, this this precur pre precursor gas onto silicon. So, the oxygen plays an important role here as you can see when you reduce the oxygen flow you go from a sloped side well the positive slope to a negative slope okay? or in other words you go from you know anisotropic process aniso to iso process right because you are etching the sides here. So, this is all because of our side wall protection you see here the side wall protection that we had right the byproduct should go and protect the side walls right. When you do not have side wall protection the radicals would start attacking. So, there will be etch from the sides. So, in order to protect that we, we use oxygen here to create that passivation when you remove that oxygen you will have you know attack of the side wall. So, why are we very sensitive about the side wall right that is because when you take a waveguide when light is propagating through this through this waveguide it will see the side wall roughness right. So, you will have side wall roughness and this side wall roughness can be avoided by using a process that protects this side wall right. So, that you do not have any bombardment of ions um, onto the side walls creating damage or creating uh, roughness on the side walls. Okay. So, this is the effect of, of uh, you know side wall protection there are two uh, uh, you know, geometries we have uh, the G 1 and G 2 where you have sloped side wall and a straight side wall right. So, when you look at the vertical side wall right uh, the loss is about 3 dB per centimeter right. When you have a sloped side wall the loss is only 2.7 dB per centimeter. So, this tells you that though you have sloped side wall right though you had a slightly sloped side wall the side wall is was protected from the ion bombardment and the side wall roughness is low that is why you have lower loss for sloped side wall. But for a vertical side wall you expose the film you know completely without any protection and that has created a lot of side wall roughness. So, this is a good thing right. Um, when you using a, a, a waveguide right with lower loss right. So, you can have slightly sloped side wall, but there is a downside to it ok. So, the downside is um, polarization effects right. So, when you when you have uh, waveguides with um, with sloped side wall you will have more bending loss coming from your polarization crosstalk. So, that is what is shown in, in this particular plot where the sloped side wall so, this is the, the sloped side wall and this is our vertical side wall. So, vertical side wall the bending loss is very small right. So, as the slope side wall the bending loss is high right. So, this is the excess bending loss coming for this. This is a characteristic of you know a polarization crosstalk or loss in the bend itself. So, when you are building any circuit you should make sure that you know the waveguides are, are not trapezoidal in, 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 uh, in nature um, that would result in these kind of uh, propagation losses. So, you can use this uh, um, uh, patterns to do uh, even finer feature in this case we can make uh, photonic crystal based grating couplers right there these are very fine features. Um, you can make this you know deep etched structure and based on this you know you, you have really good coupling here right. So, this is coupling between um, uh, fiber and photonic IC you have about 40 percentage coupling efficiency if we use this you know photonic crystal based couplers ok. So, the next thing is uh, about variability right. So, we looked at um, the fabrication of these structures um, by using dry edge process. So, we used plasma in order to etch um, the, uh, the, 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 the silicon layer, uh, but now you want to understand what is the implication of this edge on our device performance 
so the device performance strongly depends on your edge process that we saw briefly right uh, the edge process is going to create side wall roughness and this side wall roughness is going to scatter light the scattering of light would result in loss so we want to reduce that loss and that loss could be reduced by having a, a sloped side wall right and the sloped side wall no, not just sloped side wall the sloped side wall is is uh, is a is a cause of you know side wall protection right you create side wall protection um, that would result in uh, a sloped uh, side walls not too much a reasonable slope um, but the sloped side walls could result in polarization uncertainties right and bending loss so bend wave guides become lossy so we have patterned the structures now right? so we looked at lithography we looked at dry etching but now we want to look at whether the devices that i make are going to be exactly of the dimension that i wanted so that is where variability of uh, of these devices comes in so we want to look at whether this device um, are uniform or it is beyond you know our control so let us look at that so the device uh, uh, sensitivity can be easily calculated from the the dispersion curves right so you have a wire wave guide here right so where you could look at the n effective so we looked at how to calculate this n effective in the wave guide design so the n effective as a function of wave guide width right but the variability is nothing but dn you know dn effective divided by d width right you can see here when the wave guides are very narrow you see the the structure is very sensitive to small changes in the width similarly when there is a thickness variation your effective index also changes right so what is the implication right if there is a small change in the width our n effective changes so so what is what is wrong with this right the problem here is all our um, you know device response is related to effective refractive index right all the designs that we do even cav cavity length 2n t right so you you your refractive index is very important in this case the effective refractive index becomes very important so for example if you take a resonant device like a ring resonator your resonance is directly proportional to change in the refractive index right so your length remains same right you your mode the resonant mode will remain the same but when there is a change in the effective index because of either width change or thickness change your resonance wavelength will also change so it is important to make sure that your thickness and the line width is under control unless you have that you cannot fabricate devices that are reproducible and also large volume um, fabrication compatible so you we want to make sure that you uh, you have a reasonable uniformity and just to give you uh, a number right 1 nanometer variation in your waveguide width will create you know more than 1 nanometer shift in your response okay so that is very uh, uh, very large okay when it comes to communication so we are talking about you know if it is 0.8 nanometer that is you know the, the 100 gigahertz channel spacing um, between two resonances let's say if the two resonances are placed 0.8 nanometer apart your 1 nanometer is your change itself so the uncertainty is already 1 nanometer if that is the case then it is simply impossible to fabricate these devices okay so it is not possible so where where is the variability coming from so variability can come from different places right so it can start from a single chip or the die it can start intra or inter die um, or within the wafer or it can be from wafer to wafer or it could be between batch to batch okay so this variation um, uh, will be there right one should uh, one can control it but you cannot completely avoid it so when you look at the intra die 
uh, uh, or even within the wafer variation, it is primarily spatial variation. So, the device difference between you know different locations right. So, how the response of a ring resonator here, here, here and here vary right. So, this is primarily spatial variation, but then if you go for wafer to wafer because this the device in one wafer to the other wafer right. So, you process this at time t 1 and this is processed at time t 2. Similarly, large volume batches right will be also processed at different point of time. So, as a function of time you could also have variations right the process could drift because of time and the variation now when you go for large scale is a combination of spatial and temporal ok. So, both spatial variation and also temporal as a function of time is going to be a problem here. So, there are various source of this non-uniformity where is this coming from I know you probably you are thinking that it is too much I think there is a there is no way I am going to control this variability. Uh, to a certain extent the, the, the answer to that is, is yes it is simply impossible to control your uh, uh, or completely avoid variability, but you can control and keep it within a certain li limit right that is what we try to do. So, when you want a, a, a waveguide, so you have a certain width defined right. So, you, you ideally you want this to be w, but then you have to give some tolerance. So, it can be plus or minus 10 nanometer plus or minus 20 nanometers is what you are looking for. So, when you have this uh, 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 variation uh, tolerance given then accordingly we can choose and control the process here. So, it can come from the mask as I mentioned earlier this can come from the, the lithography process the, uh, the resist process or you know the wafer in itself the flatness of wafer, thickness of wafer and so on and it can also come from the edge process. So, I want you to spend some time just pause and then look at each and every you know thing that can go wrong and uh, under each unit process ok. So, we can we can talk about in detail, but we do not have time um, in this particular course. Um, but there is another course on um, uh, micro and nano fabrication where you know the uh, details are covered in that. So, here we just appreciate the fact that there is there is a lot of uh, contributing factors when it comes to non-uniformity. So, here we, we, we take a simple silicon uh, uh, silicon on insulator wafer and then look at what is the thickness right. The target is is uh, is 220 right, but then your mean is only 218 right and this is coming from each wafer. So, there are you know 23 wafers here. So, when you look at the wafer, so there is a each wafer there is a variation right. So, within wafer we have about 3 percentage variation that means, plus or minus 3 and a half nanometers and wafer to wafer you have 2 percentage variation which is about 2 nanometer you know from wafer to wafer. So, these variations are you know close to our requirement in terms of you know channel spacing or you know spectral response. So, one should take this into account when we are fabricating. So, not only uh, uh, the thickness and the line width going to affect you, it is also the density of devices right. So, what do we have uh, next to our, our devices will also affect your response. So, what you see here is a, is a ring resonator and this resonator device is now you know surrounded by some structures right. So, here you have isolated um, a ring right. So, this is uh, a resonator, but then you have dummy structures or you know dense structure coming in. So, when you have dense structures close to the device right, then the response actually changes right and then when they go out then you come back to the original response. So, this is coming from local device you know uh, effects when during fabrication. So, when you are fabricating this device the process for example, the, the dry edge process strongly depends on the density of device. 
So, your densi device density will affect right your uniformity also. So, when you want to cramp more number of devices make sure that you know um, you take care of the environment. Okay. So, this is what it is shown here the density of the device is increasing. So, is our the standard deviation or the response itself is actually changing. So, one should be careful about um, the layout uh, while you are designing this. So, once you have fabricated this device we have to do the cladding. So, cladding is the cover that you put on top right. So, um, in case of silicon or silicon nitride uh, waveguides. So, we put silicon dioxide as a coating material to protect the waveguides here. Okay. So, silicon uh, uh, dioxide as we all know is a standard dielectric material that we use in, in CMOS right. So, in microelectronics um, uh, silicon dioxide is heavily used for various purpose that are listed here. You use it for active area isolation, uh, gate dielectric we can use, we use for gap filling and also intermetal dielectric fill. So, intermetal metallic layer is also silicon dioxide. So, at some point uh, people also use silicon carbide and silicon nitride as dielectric uh, uh, in, in, in CMOS, but we use silicon nitride and also silicon carbide as a waveguide layer if you like. Right. So, silicon dioxide is preferred uh, for all practical purpose because the refractive index of, uh, of silicon is 3.45 and refractive index of silicon dioxide is 1.45. So, you get good index contrast between with, with silicon. So, we like to use silicon dioxide instead of any other dielectrics here. So, how do we deposit? So, there are multiple ways to deposit. We already saw uh, 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 plasma based deposition uh, which is chemical uh, vapor deposition, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. We can also use low pressure chemical vapor deposition and also high density plasma deposition. So, these are all different ways of depositing um, uh, silicon dioxide uh, by using different um, you know precursor, precursor gases primarily uh, silene as, uh, as a constituent gas. We can also do physical vapor deposition where we can physically transport the material which is, uh, uh, which is, which is good for certain application, but primarily for photonic application we want the, uh, the material to be uh, dense right and uniform. So, we use chemical vapor deposition. As you can see um, based on this technique you can deposit at you know reasonably um, acceptable temperature um, 670 is really high temperature if you um, if you want to do uh, deposition on metals and so on you need to have low temperature process right. So, these are all the, the ways that you can do evaporation and sputtering um, in this case uh, these are all the ways that you can deposit low pressure CVD, plasma enhanced TVD or atmospheric pressure CVD. Your chemical uh, vapor deposition process works you know reasonably straightforward. The one process is starting with diffusion where the precursor gas diffuse onto the sub, uh, uh, substrate that you have and then it gets adsorbed right. So, you, 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 you get the product here that is adsorbed and then whatever uh, reaction products that you have it will diffuse out right. So, desorbed out of the surface. So, whatever is adsorbed stays there, whatever is not adsorbed will leave the surface. And this is again done using plasma process, there is no thermal energy provided, this is um, done at you know 400 can do it at 400 degree C relatively low temperature and the energy for this reaction is given by the plasma itself. So, this is something that we have already uh, discussed earlier when we talked about H all the configuration remains the same right. So, you have RF you have the plates here and the only thing is the gas here is HIS4 and N2O right instead of H gases. So, when it comes to filling, when it comes to depositing the material right. So, when you take a flat surface it is relatively easy to deposit a uniform layer. 
But then when you have a topography, mostly the case in our applications where we already defined a silicon waveguide, right? So now we have to fill this area. So if you want to fill this area, then you should make sure that you have a complete fill, right? So this is a conformal filling. So this is what we call the conformal filling. But then here you see a directional fill, right? That has a highly vertical directional fill where the side walls are not filled with the same amount of thickness. And even more directional, this is anisotropic fill, there is no deposition on the side walls. There is completely no deposition on the side walls. So, you could have another type of deposition where you know you will have something intermediary between you know completely isotropic and anisotropic. Uh, this could be uh, an, uh, an isotropic process because of the, um, uh, the, the angle that you have, right. This collects more material compared to the flat surfaces here because look at the angle here. You can get it from here and also you can get it from here, okay. So, you will grow much faster in these corners compared to flat surface. And this uh, cross section images actually tells you uh, the SEM cross section images tells you the different um, you know filling properties. You can see here LPCVD process uh, low pressure chemical vapor deposition process is a, is a conformal process where you know you have smooth filling. And then we have high density plasma filling which is also conformal. But then there is a plasma oxide deposition where you can see the void. And this void is coming from our discussion about this, right. So, these grow faster and then they will close creating a void here, right. And that is exactly what has happened here. So, when the material grows, it is depositing, but it is depositing more creating what you call keyhole, right, a void here. So, these voids are, are undesirable because of the reliability reason and also you know um, when you are having a directional coupler. So, this is actually a directional coupler, right? The light is going to sit here, but then the presence of void is to it will change the kappa between these two waveguides, okay? So, any kind of fabrication um, you know non-idealities are going to affect your performance, you know as desired. So, the next thing is about the chemical nature of, of the material that, that we are depositing, right. So, this is a, a Fourier transform infrared spectrum of, of silicon dioxide, right. Different kind of oxides, we talked about three different plasma oxides, right. So, when you have uh, these oxides, they also have you know absorption ca capacity to you know take water in right. So, there could be water absorption uh, because the, the product contains water. If you remember um, our silicon dioxide formation right results in water vapor right. So, this water vapor could be incorporated in, in, in silicon uh, dioxide film and that would result in absorption particularly when you are working in IR range you will have absorption. So, how do we characterize that? So, we characterize this by using FTAR. So, you can see here um, for low pressure uh, CVD technique using Theos, you see there is a water present here, right. And when you take um, high density um, uh, silicon dioxide or PECVD process, there is hardly any uh, water present then, right. So, we have to uh, look at the chemistries that we do in order to make sure that we do not have any uh, chemical absorbing species inside the, um, uh, the cladding material or even waveguide material that you have. So, one way of reducing is by annealing as you can see here when you anneal the film, right, you reduce your concentration here, all right. So, material compositions are very important to understand and that should be done in order to uh, assess whether there are some additional losses coming in because of this material. So, this is the very important material selection problem that you, you, you should 
uh, look at. So, the bottom line is by you uh, uh, using high density plasma or plasma enhanced CVD is much better than Theos based or you know LPCVD, Theos based LPCVD oxide. So, uh, uh, finally, on the doping front, so we want to create let us say junctions, right. So, we talked about this junctions um, in our detectors, but we, we also use this uh, junctions to create modulators in silicon, which we will see uh, shortly later. Um, so, the doping uh, is going to help you to um, change the conductivity, right. That is the, uh, the primary reason uh, for creating um, uh, this this doped semiconductors right. So, you could have high conductivity right which is um, you know P or um, N plus plus. It could be completely insulating um, uh, when you have really intrinsic material uh, or you could have something you know intermediary where we could you know have P plus let us say right. So, you could have completely intrinsic material like you know silicon dioxide that could act as a uh, insulator, but silicon when it is completely you know undoped right intrinsic uh, silicon has a very very high resistivity right very low conductivity uh, that we can also use. So, based on on that uh, we could uh, dope this silicon um, by either using you know electro uh, electron donor or electron acceptor um, and by uh, doping it with um, in phosphorus are um, are seen we can uh, create uh, uh, you know electron rich um, uh, 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 species or you can do um, boron doping in order to do p type all right so um, or uh, a positive uh, polarity here okay so you can um, use any of this um, uh, uh, doping or dopants uh, to create a doping uh, doped semiconductors uh, that where you can uh, create difference in the electrical conductivity. So, there are two ways to do it one is ion implantation that means you create this uh, ions. So, this is boron or phosphorus ions um, and then you accelerate it and this ions are accelerated and they bombard and then they are incorporated. So, you you have to bombard the atoms you know uh, the ions into the into, into silicon um, and once you bombard it they are just sitting there right. Um, but you have to make them react and that is what we call the activation anneal. So, we have to heat it up that will result in activation and also repair the, the, the bombardment would create amorphization of the uh, of, of the silicon here. So, when you are annealing it, uh, it will recrystallize. So, we can also do it by using diffusion doping. So, in this case we can deposit a layer oxide layer that contains boron and then you heat it up right. So, the high temperature is used here. Uh, the only problem is this is isotropic in nature. So, the, the dopant will dis diffuse in um, all the directions equally you do not want that. And um, uh, and you can control that. Okay, so it creates uh, uh, profile control issues, and uh, we can do it with large uh, wafers. So since it is a thermal process, we can put it into a furnace and then make this happen, right? And you can see here the junction depth is very large, right? When you when you do diffusion doping, because it's simply hard to control it. However, with implantation. Uh, we can use um, you know uh, a photoresist mask here while you need to have silicon dioxide mask because you are using high temperature process. And here uh, it is very directional because you are coming with some um, uh, you know highly directional ions and you can create very shallow junctions right very sharp junctions we can make and we can have excellent control of profile and you can create any kind of doping profile. P P, P plus plus and P right or P plus any kind of uh, combination you can do it, but the only thing is it is a sing you can do single wafer process for large. You can also do batch processing uh, based on the size of your um, of your uh, processing tool. 
So, with that we, we come to an end of all the important fabrication process necessary uh, to realize uh, a simple uh, silicon photonic integrated circuit right. So, you can also apply this to other platforms like silicon nitride or even polymer material and silicon uh, carbide as well. So, any type of uh, process uh, could be used to realize you know this uh, uh, photonic circuits on different kind of material system. So, um, for, for, for instance if you are going to use silicon nitride or polymer um, you, you cannot use um, this doping for example. So, only passive devices can be made and thus those passive devices can be made by using a uh, deposition process to get the, the material and then using lithography and dry etching to pattern the material. Okay. So, um, these are all the fundamental processes that we will use in order to define photonic integrated circuits of your interest. Thank you very much for listening.